Sometimes we have two populations and we want to know something about the difference between the means of each of those populations. Now, if we don't actually know the means, we could take an independent random sample, one from each population, and take a look at the difference in means between the samples. And this would give us a point estimate of what the difference between the means of the population may be. Now, in order to come up with something more than a point estimate, to come up with a confidence interval for the difference in the means, then we need to think about what the distribution of the difference in means looks like. So we're going to make use of our extension of the central limit theorem that allows us to approximate this distribution as normal, assuming the two sample sizes are large enough. So we need to recall from our extension of the central limit theorem that the mean of the sampling distribution of the difference between the two means is equal to the difference of the population means for the two populations. And the standard deviation for that sampling distribution is equal to the square root of the variance of the first population divided by the sample size taken from that population plus the population variance of the second population divided by the size of the sample taken from that distribution. Now, we also said that we can approximate the sampling distribution as normal, given that our n1 and n2 are large enough. And so we're going to have our standard normal variable z, where we're taking our point estimate minus our mean divided by our standard deviation. So what that looks like is this. So now, just like we did with a single sample, we can find a confidence interval for the difference in the means. We can claim that with a probability of one minus alpha, this z standard normal variable will fall between negative z sub alpha divided by two and z sub alpha divided by two. So we have the probability that negative z sub alpha divided by 2 is less than z is less than z sub alpha divided by 2 is equal to 1 minus alpha. Now, substituting our equation here in for z, we can actually solve this for the difference of means of the population that we don't actually know. And when we're finished solving, for the difference of the means that can give us the confidence interval. So using the inequality that we found, we can compute a confidence interval for the difference in means of our population the same way we did when we had a single sample. Now everything we've done so far has been looking at this when our variances are known, our population variances are known. So now we want to look at the case where the variances are unknown. So there's two possibilities. We can know that the population variance between the two different populations is equal, but we don't know what it is. Or we could know that they're not equal and we don't know what they are. Um, so we're going to take care of that first case first. So we don't know what the population variances are, but they are equal to each other. So in order to do this, we're going to make what's called a pooled estimate of a population variance. And what this is going to do is it's going to take our two samples and it's going to take them and combine them and look at their variances combined. So basically what we're doing is we're increasing our sample size by looking at both samples together to estimate what the variance is, which makes it a more accurate estimate of what our population variance is. So this is the formula that you'll use to find a pooled estimate of variance. And we denote that with a little subscript P 
with our variance, our s squared symbol. Now, since we don't know the variances, we have to use the t distribution instead of a normal distribution. So our t statistic, we can actually calculate by looking at the difference in our sample means minus the difference in our population means divided by this pooled estimate of the variance times the square root of one over n1 plus one over n2. So similar to how we have in the past, we wanna know really what the probability is that this t statistic falls between negative t sub alpha divided by two and t sub alpha divided by two. And we're particularly interested in when that probability is equal to one minus alpha. Now, if we substitute in the t statistic equation here that we have for our t statistic in our probability, and then we go through solving for the difference in population means like we did before, then we get the confidence interval for the difference in population means when the population variances are equal to each other, but both unknown. So when we do that, what we end up with is the difference in sample means, and then minus on our left-hand side, plus on our right-hand side, t sub alpha divided by two, our pooled standard deviation, that's the square root of our pooled variance that we could calculate from our equation before, times the square root of one over n1 plus one over n2. And what this does is it gives us a confidence interval for that difference in population means. Now, since we're dealing with the t-distribution, we need to know how many degrees of freedom we're dealing with. In this case, we're looking at n1 plus n2 minus two degrees of freedom. So basically we're looking at the number of degrees of freedom from the first sample plus the number of degrees of freedom from the second sample, which is what gives us that v equals n1 plus n2 minus two degrees of freedom. And again, remember the t distribution is looking at leaving area to the right. Now there's another case where we might want the confidence interval for the difference in the population means where our population variances are both unknown and unequal to one another. So if this is the case, we can find this. Our confidence interval looks very similar to the previous one, except for in that square root, we're going to take the variance of the first sample divided by the size of the first sample plus the variance of the second sample divided by the size of the second sample. Also, a big difference is the way that we calculate our degrees of freedom. So we can't just add the degrees of freedom from the two samples quite so easily. So we have to use this formula where we're taking our variance of our first sample divided by the size of the first sample plus the variance of the second sample divided by the size of the second sample. And then we're going to be taking the variance of the first sample divided by the size of the first sample, squaring that and dividing it by n minus or n1 minus one, so the size of the first sample minus one. And then we're gonna be adding that to doing the same thing with the second sample and that's gonna compose the denominator for when we're finding our degrees of freedom. Now, a key thing to note is this is rarely gonna be a whole number, and we need a whole number when we're talking about degrees of freedom. So this is just an estimate of the degrees of freedom, and to complete the estimate, once you calculate this, you're going to round it down, always down, to the nearest whole number. So sometimes it might even be something like 7.98 and you're still going to round it down to seven instead of rounding it to eight, all right? But otherwise, this behaves the same exact way.